All right, good morning. <clears throat> so I'll wait another minute or so just to make sure everybody gets here. But what we did last time was we did trigonometric functions and their inverses. This is slightly different than the syllabus. So I was going back to the syllabus just in case so that we match the labs and the topics that you do in the labs. But because it was asked in the first class how to make functions one to one, even if they're not one to one, I did the example of the three trigonometric functions, sine, cos, and tan. None of these are one to one. They all fail the horizontal line test on their entire domains. So what we do is we restrict our domains to these specific intervals, negative pi over two to pi over two for sine, zero to pi for cos, and then the open interval negative pi over two to pi over two for arc tangent. And then we can define their inverses. So for these ones, you have to be more careful. But when you have an x value in those intervals, depending on which trigonometric function you you have, when you have cosine and arc cosine or cos inverse touch each other, you can cancel them in the equation. The same thing will happen with logarithms and exponentials. <clears throat> and then what we want to start doing is there will be one more class of functions also called the hyperbolic functions which are linear combinations of the exponential functions. But we will do that in a couple of weeks when we do, after we do the logarithms and all the properties and their derivatives. And so now what we're going to have is we're going to have these categories of three categories of transcendental functions. We're going to have the trigonometric functions, the exponential functions, and the hyperbolic functions. And then we're going to have their inverses. So then we're going to have inverse trig, inverse exponentials, which are called logarithms, and then inverse hyperbolic functions. And then we want the derivatives of the trigonometric functions and the derivative of the inverse trig. And we want the derivative of those exponential functions and the derivative of those logarithms, the derivative of hyperbolic functions, the derivative of inverse hyperbolic functions. And then the same thing for antiderivatives or indefinite integrals. We want the integral of all those categories. So today, what we're going to do is the exponential functions and their inverses logarithms discuss those functions and then their derivatives hopefully so <clears throat> as we do that we have to so we want we want to consider functions that are a to the x essentially but what does that look like and how do we compute those values? And A has to be a positive number. Otherwise, we could take negative one to the one half, which is essentially the square root of negative one. And that's not a real number anymore. And this is why we have to have the base of the exponential function to be a positive number. So we want to consider the functions. f of x equals a to the x, where a is a positive real number. And so what does it mean? To compute, say, 2 to the x. So 2 to the 3 or two to the three halves or two to the pi. What are those equal? What's the decimal expansion? What I'm asking is what's the decimal expansion of these? So what we want to do is successive approximation of these weird guys or define this in each category. What we're going to do is we consider two to the n for n in each of the sets. Z plus n, z, which is the negative numbers, 
then the rationals, then the irrationals. So these are positive integers. This is the natural number we add zero. This is the integers we add negatives. And then we have the rational numbers or the quotients. This is going to be m over n using set builder notation such that m is in red and n is in z plus. This is rationals. And then this is Q complement is <coughs> R says that R specifically is not equal to M over N. These are irrationals. And then the real numbers is Q union Q complement. You should have done basic unions, et cetera, in 114. This is what this means. The real numbers, this is the reals. So the real numbers are the disjoint union of the rationals and the irrationals. This is every real number is equal to a rational or an irrational. And those are disjoint, no number can have. This is intuitively repeating decimal or you can have non-repeating. Decimal expansion. So every real number has a decimal expansion and it's either repeating or non-repeating. We use the rationals to approximate the irrationals of the point. So definition, if A is greater than zero, what is, or, If n is a positive integer, so we start with the first set, this one. And if we start with this set, what do we get? We end up getting the fact that we're just going to multiply a to the n is equal to a times a times a. And we're going to do this n times. So as an immediate example, if we take two to the three, we mean that this exactly means two times two times two, three times, which ends up being the number eight. So you're gonna get a number. Now we wanna ask ourselves definition, a to the zero is equal to one for all. A and R. So two to the zero is equal to one, definitely. Then we want to, I'm just gonna quickly go through each type of number. So this is what we mean by computing the exponent. We have to go through each number. <clears throat> now, definition, if A is positive and N is a positive integer, then A to the negative N is going to equal by definition one over a to the n. So what that means is it's the reciprocal of the inverse or it's the reciprocal of a to the n where a to the n is the positive version. So as an example, again, if I have two is a and n is now three, 
this implies that 2 to the negative 3 is equal to 1 over 2 to the 3, which is 1 over 8, because we knew that 2 to the 3 was 8. So that's how we do the negative numbers. It's 1 over. Then we ask ourselves, what is the nth roots? So we have definition. In this case, the square root of a is equal to b if and only if a is equal to b squared. So square, this is square roots. And then nth roots in general, the nth root of a is equal to b if and only if a equals b to the n. These are nth roots. What we want to notice is a to the nth root is equal to a to the 1 over n, so the denominator in the fractional exponent. This is extremely useful because now what we can do with this is we can compute fractions. So definition. <coughs> r equals m over n is a rational number, then we have that a to the r is equal to a to the m over n, which is by definition the nth root of a to the power m. So we now know how to compute rational numbers. And then the final thing we have is definition, essentially, if n is an irrational number, we approximate n with rational r. Better and better. Usually we find a sequence or something that can approximate the, ir the irrational number with rational numbers. And we define a to the n is equal to the limit as r approaches n. So we get r rational numbers to get better and better, or closer and closer in decimal expansion to the n guys, a to the r. So we use a to the r, where r is rational, to approximate the irrational ones. So and as an example, if we want to know what uh, 2 to the pi is, this is going to be approximately equal to, pi is approximately equal to 3.14, or in rational form, this is equal to 2 to the 314 over 100, which is actually, you can reduce a little bit. I'm cheating because it's in my lecture notes, but you can take the two out. And then how do you compute this? This guy, two to the 157 over 50 is going to be the 50th root of two to the power 157, which turns out to be I'm not using, I use a calculator at that stage. That's what we use calculators for as a tool, not a crutch. So this is how we're computing irrational numbers or two to the pi. If you want a better, a better approximation of its decimal expansion, two to the pi is gonna be irrational as well. So it has an infinite non-repeating decimal expansion. But if you wanna get some of its digits in decimal expansion, you have to use rational numbers which approximate it. All right, so that's our exponential function. If we build a function now and start plotting points, oh, just wait, I should do one more thing. Here's the exponential laws, and then I'll do the logarithm laws. No calculators as far as I'm, as far as I know, I'm not going to make you compute those types of things. That's what I said. I used a calculator here, but all the things we give you on quizzes won't require a calculator like this.
the only ones that might are yeah but there's no calculators in these classes it's no it's it, so they're not going to make you calculate the two to the pi they're going to give you questions that won't require a calculator in that way but if it was yeah you'd use a scientific calculator in other classes but in this one most of the questions on quizzes and stuff are going to be finding the inverse of the function or computing derivatives etc it won't require you to use a calculator specifically yeah i have like two or three ti 83 somewhere and i can't find them anymore because i don't use them but they're here somewhere my daughter want, needs to use one and then i don't know where it is <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need calculators. We're gonna just use this calculator in the brain. All right, so the exponent laws. So one, and the laws are basically a lot of the things that I just went over. A to the zero is one, remember this, two, a to the negative n is equal to one over a to the n. How do you get a negative exponent positive? You move it to the other side of the division sign. Three, a to the m times a to the n is a to the m plus n. And four, a to the m times n is equal to a to the m n. Five, a, B to the N, if you have two bases and one exponent, yes, you can distribute this A to the N, B to the N, and then six, we have A over B to the N, you can distribute this onto a fraction as well, A to the N over B to the N, and then seven, I guess we have, yeah, A, B to the negative N is, you're gonna flip it, and then it's going to be B to the N over A to the N, and eight, if you wanna make things positive, how do you make the negative exponent positive? You move it to the other side of a division sign. And so this is the rule you're gonna get a to the negative n over a to the negative m is gonna be a to the m over a to the n. Or sorry, this should be a b. I just get copyright. But you wanna flip the basis. Again, go over all these exponent laws. Once we do this kind of thing, what we're going to get is we're going to build the exponential function. The exponential function. Base A is A y equals f of x which equals a to the x, where x is any real number. So this is the domain, basically. What we're considering is a to the x is going to be a function that goes from r, and then we're going to see that it goes from the open interval 0 to infinity. The range is 0 infinity. What that says is it's never 0. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So if we had, say, b to the negative m over a to the n, that would be the same as saying 1 over a to the n times b to the m? You have to write it down. You want what? One of these laws that you're just saying? Yes. It's b to the negative m over a to the n is equivalent to one over a to the n times b to the m. This, you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay, anytime I wanna move, any time I wanna move this to the other, to make this exponent positive, I move it to the other side of the division sign. Yeah, and that's because by definition, we're defining this as one over the reciprocal of b to the m. And that's why I always use numbers. Two to the negative three is always going to be equal to one over two to the three, which is one over eight. And then if you're adding those in there, you're just multiplying numbers. 
basically is what's happening. Yeah. Good. So now once we're comfortable, yeah, and this is what also is weird. That's why I show you how to compute all of these numbers, because what does it mean? This is intuitively obvious. What does it mean to multiply two by itself three times? Well, you just go two times two times two and you get eight. It's like, okay, well, what does it mean to multiply a number by three over two, right? If I have a or two to the three over two, that's weird at first, but what does that mean? You're just gonna take the square root of two and then you're gonna cube it. And then the square root of two is 1.414 dot 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 two one three. And then you can cube that and you get an approximation of what that number is going to be. That's going to approximately equal 1.414 dot 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 cubed. And then so you can get a number, a decimal expansion of it. What does it mean to be an nth root? Once we do that, we get the function that looks like this, the exponential function. When a is a fraction, it'll go the other way. This is a larger than one specifically. But notice if I take a to the negative x also, that's going to look like this. And so what we notice is they all go through a to the zero is always one for all A. And so this implies that there has to be at least one of these guys where the derivative is exactly the slope of, of the tangent line there, which is exactly one. And we wanna know which base gives us exactly that slope equal to one. But before we do that, what we're gonna notice is Both of these functions, a to the x or a to the negative x, they're one to one. Y equals a to the x is one to one. You can also show that it's monotonically increasing. So it has to be one to one but we have no algebraic way of solving for the inverse. No algebraic way of solving for the inverse. So we follow John Napier and what he says is a logarithm. So what we're gonna get is instead, give it a name. Logarithm. So, definition. Logarithms are the inverses of exponential functions. If a is a positive number, then y equals a to the x if and only if log base a of y equals x. And you don't have to put the brackets to match if you want. But that's saying the definition of inverse. Logarithms are the inverses of exponential functions. Therefore, one, the cancellation laws. One. And of course, logarithm is going from 
zero infinity into R. And we can sketch the logarithm, even though we don't have an algebraic formula for it. We get what the graph looks like by reflecting the graph of a to the x across the line y equals x. This is how we're going to get this for this transcendental function. But one, if we have log base a of a to the x, this is equal to x or x in r. So that one always cancels. But what that's really saying is cancel, cancel. As soon as logarithm touches, log base a touches a, then this goes away. The cancellation laws. How do you cancel subtraction with addition? You add two. How do you do division or multiplication? You cancel multiplication with division. How do you cancel logarithms with exponentials? And how do you cancel exponentials with logarithms? Two, a to the log base a of x is or y, let's say, equals y or y in zero infinity. This is saying that you can cancel these types of things. And this is the clever tricks that we're gonna to use to prove some of the derivatives, et cetera. But we use these cancellation laws in reverse. But this says that if you're doing composition, remember this is log a following a to the x, or this is one, and two is a to the x following log base a to the x. This is composition. As soon as you compose those functions, because they're inverses, they cancel each other off. And so what do these functions look like? If this is a to the x, log a to the x is gonna go through zero one. So it's gonna have a single root and this will be at one zero. If this is zero one, because we're reflecting about the line y equals x, because they're inverses. This is f of x and this is f inverse of x. So for this specific case, we get the graph of the logarithm for free essentially is what we're trying to say, because we know that the graph will be reflected about the line y equals x. And so this is what the logarithms look like. In particular, we have two special logarithms. If we write just log x, we mean by definition log base 10 of x like the Richter scale for earthquakes, et cetera. If this is every time you're in a different category or class, this takes you up orders of magnitude, stronger uh, vibrations when we do this. So log X is log base 10. And so this is the X. So this would be 10 to the X y equals 10 to the x if and only if log y equals x. They're not writing the 10 is what, they're, what they mean by this. And ln, ln x is by definition log base e of x. And we're going to discuss e right now. So this is where, oh, sorry, base. N equals E. The so this means, and this is the natural logarithm. This means E to the X equals Y if and only if ln X Y equals X. Exponentials are inverses of logarithms in the case where the exponent is e to the x, the inverse is natural log ln x, where now we can do 
E approximately equal to 2.718281828459045. It's an infinite non-repeating decimal expansion. So what is this? This is is defined as the real number such that we have the limit as h approaches zero, e to the h minus one over h is exactly equal to one. What they're getting at is this. We know all the exponential functions go through zero, one. Or, yeah, zero, one. And so there's got to be a function that does this, and this will be three to the x, and then we're going to have another one that will be let's just say two. So there has to be some number, and what we want is we want to know exactly here. We want the slope of the tangent line, i.e., derivative at that at zero one to be m exactly equals one. We can even use for this one a two point five x like I did in my lecture notes. So when a is equal to 2.5, this implies that m is approximately equal to 0 0.95, the slope of the tangent line. We want the slope of the tangent line to be exactly to equal to 1. And when a is equal to 3, we get m is approximately equal to 1.1. Therefore, there is some number e between 2.5 and 3 with 2 less than e less than 3, or you can even use the better 2.5 if you want, such that the limit as h approaches 0 of e to the h minus 1 over h is exactly equal to 1. That's what we want. And so since that happens as a consequence, given y equals e to the x, this says that the derivative with respect to x of e to the x is equal to what? By definition, this is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h which is equal to the limit as h approaches zero, I'm gonna use exponent laws, e to the x times e to the h minus e to the x over h. Now I have e to the x in both terms on the top, so I can factor that out. That's actually in fact equal to e to the x times the limit as h approaches zero, because we're pushing h to zero, not x of e to the h minus one over h, but that's exactly equal to one by definition above. So because by this definition, so because of that, we get e to the x times one or e to the x the instantaneous rate of change of e to the x is the value of e to the x at that point. This is the only function that does this. The moral of the story is the derivative of e to the x is itself. This is the only function that's going to do it. Now what we want to do is use a clever trick to find out what's the derivative of all of the other exponential functions. 
we should do that next. Yeah. I'm just making sure I didn't forget any. I should probably do a question like that also. But let me squish in the derivative of all the inverses. Yeah, I'll do logarithm log in a second. Yeah, okay. So in general, what are we going to get for the derivative of a to the x? What if y equals a to the x? What is the derivative? What we're going to do is we're going to play a dirty trick. What I want to do, first of all, is we need the logarithm laws. What we're going to do is we're going to say, well, first of all, we want uh, log base A of multiplication on the inside is addition on the inside or addition on the outside. So this will be log base A of, let me make sure I get them all. of m plus log base a of n to, if you have division on the inside of a logarithm, this is subtraction on the outside. Again, why is this useful? Because computing logarithms is hard, but computing this on multiple and doing multiplication on top of it is even worse. So if you can do addition in a lot of cases, it's better than doing uh, multiplication. So log, especially when we're using, taking derivatives of things log base a of m over n is going to be log base a of m minus log base a of n. Three, this is extremely important for, this is the rule that I'm gonna use right away in taking the derivative, log base a of x to the r, a is going to be equal to r times log base a of x. So exponent on the inside of a logarithm is multiplication by that number on the outside. And four, four is how you connect the rate of change of all general exponential functions or the derivatives to the deriv uh, number involving uh, e. And so we have log base a of x can always be written as natural logarithms or any other base but in particular we want the natural logarithms the natural logarithm of x over the natural logarithm of a and i'm going to use that fact to take the derivative of general logarithms so the idea is instead of trying to do by brute force, finding the derivative of log base A of X, I'm gonna find the derivative of, of just natural logarithm. And then I'm gonna use this equality to take the derivative of log A X. But before we do that, I'm going to use this one, number three, exponent on the inside is multiplication by that number on the outside of logarithm to find the derivative of A to the X. So I'll erase these two sitting in between arrows. So what I'm going to cleverly do is, first of all, I know that a to the x is actually equal to e to the ln a to the x. How did I do that? Because E and natural log are inverses of each other. So they do cancel each other. So this is a true statement, but it's the statement in reverse, right? So as soon as E and log touch each other, you, just, you do just get A to the X. The clever idea is adding it in there. And then we know the derivative of E is the point and log is just a number. So now what I'm gonna say is that exponent X, which is my variable, is exponent on the inside can be number on the outside. So this is now going to equal 
e to the x times ln a. And ln a is just a number. So now what is the derivative of this? That equals the derivative of e to the x ln a. And so I'm gonna use the chain rule equals by the chain rule. This is equal to what? Itself. Because e is its own derivative as above times the derivative of the inside. And what's the derivative of x times a number? This is equal to e to the x ln a times what? We're going to get ln a times the derivative of x because ln a is just a number. I can take this out of derivative. Derivative doesn't care about this. This is the scalar rule for derivatives. And then this is e to the x ln a times ln a times one. And now what was this guy? This, I just recollapsed this. This is just e to the ln a to the x again times ln a, which is these now cancel, which I do collapse them. And I cleverly have that this is a to the x ln a. What's the moral of the story? The derivative with respect to x of a to the x is equal to itself times ln a. The derivative of every exponential function is directly proportional to itself, a to the x. And that proportionality constant involves the number e because ln a is equal to log base e of a, remember. So all exponential functions have a rate of change which are directly proportional to a number which involves e. And this is why e is such an important number for us. Now we want to do for logarithms, we want the derivative of logarithms and that's next week anyways, but I can probably squish it in now. So the derivatives, yeah, we have like six minutes. No, no, we have like eight minutes. So for the logarithms, we use an alternate definition of the natural logarithm. So we define the natural logarithm of X is defined to be the integral from one to X of one over t dt. So do you know what that's doing? What is this from 114? Who is this guy? And how are they defining the natural logarithm this way? This is Riemann sums. I have a function one over t. And then they're saying right here, I have one to X. This is X here. So it's the area under one over X or one over T. If I have the function one over t and I compute the area under one over t from one to x, this gives me the value log x. This is what natural logarithm is. Therefore, by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, that didn't spell it. We know that says the derivative 
of the natural logarithm is equal to the derivative of the integral from one to x of one over t dt, which is equal to what? One over x by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the moral of the story is the derivative of the natural log of x is equal to one over x. And what is the derivative therefore of log base A of X? We use property four of logarithms. Log base A of X equals ln X over ln A. Therefore we can write the derivative as the derivative with respect to x of log base a of x is equal to now the derivative with respect to x of ln x divided by ln a, which is a number, which I can take out of the derivative, which is just one over ln a times the derivative with respect to x of log x, which we now know is one over x. And so that's the derivative of log base a of x. The moral of the story is the derivative of log base a of x is equal to one over x ln a is what the book will write. This is the derivative of the exponential functions and the derivative of logarithms. If you want extra practice in my lecture notes specifically, there are some way uh, examples that help you practice the exponent laws and the logarithm laws so that you get comfortable using these laws. But the most important ones are exponent on the inside is number on the outside. This will be useful for when we use logarithmic differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. But for now, what we've just learned is the derivative of the exponential function is itself. Using that fact, we get that the derivative of a to the x is a to the x ln a. Then once we do the inverse of x uh, exponents, we get logarithms in particular, the natural logarithm is the inverse function of the exponential function e to the x, this magic number. The derivative of natural log of x is one over x. And using the logarithm laws, we see that the derivative of log base a of x is one over x ln a. This actually does work for ln x as well, because this would be one over x ln e to the one. And as soon as log and e touch each other, you're gonna get that this cancels. So this is just gonna be one over x. So the rule works for every base, log base e, log base a. The derivative is going to be one over x ln a. So now we know the rates of change or the derivatives of the exponential functions and their inverses logarithms. We're eventually going to want to know also what are the integrals of these. And we're going to specifically for logarithms, we're going to need a new technique called integration by parts to figure this out. We can get the integral for free because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, for instance. Then if we integrate both sides, derivative and integral are inverse operators of each other by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So they cancel each other. And then we get the integral of e to the x dx is itself plus of course a constant of integration. So the derivative rules give us integration rules. And in particular, because the derivative with respect to x of a to the x, I now know is a to the x ln a. If I integrate both sides, the derivative and integral cancel each other because they're inverse operators of one another. When they touch, they cancel. And so I get a to the x is equal to ln a is just a number, which I can take outside of an integral, which it's non-zero if a is uh, larger than one. So this will be a to the x over ln a is equal to the integral of a to the x dx. And then of course, we want to write that as plus C. 
So the integral of a to the x dx is equal to a to the x over ln a plus c. So we get the integrals, the antiderivatives of the exponential functions for free because we know that the derivative had this nice formula to involve themselves. So we can just solve for these using the fundamental theorem of calculus part one and part two. Integrals cancel each other. Our integrals and derivatives cancel each other. So they're inverse operators of one another. And then I get the integral of the exponential functions also. But now what is the integral of log base a of x dx. We need integration by parts. So this is why chapter two, once we have all of these transcendental functions, we're going to do integration techniques because we're need, gonna need to know how to integrate trigonometric functions and inverse trigonometric functions and logarithms and uh, hyperbolic functions and inverse hyperbolic functions. We wanna know what their derivatives are and what their antiderivatives are. And to do this, we're going to need integration techniques. So in technique of partial fraction decomposition for rational functions, we'll do certain categories, but then we have trigonometric functions and uh, radical functions. So we want to use trigonometric substitution and integration by parts and substitution and regular substitution and weird algebraic substitutions. What we're trying to do is find the antiderivative of a bunch of general categories of functions. In particular, for any of the inverse transcendental functions, we want to use integration by parts. So we have trigonometric functions and inverse trigonometric functions, arc sine, arc cos, arc tan. To find the integral of arc cos arc sine arc tan, we're going to use integration by parts. Then we're going to have exponential functions and logarithms. The inverse is logarithms. So to find the antiderivative of logarithms, we need integration by parts. Then we're going to have hyperbolic functions and inverse hyperbolic functions. To find the invert integrals or antiderivative indefinite integrals of these inverse hyperbolic functions, we need to use integration by parts. So the good news is integration by parts will give us the indefinite integral of all the inverse transcendental functions. So we'll leave it for there. You can have your weekend and go digest. But that I went back, I have to follow what the course outline says in the curriculum. I was gonna do it, the way that I would do this is I would define all the trig, all the transcendental functions. So the six trigonometric functions, then the exponential functions, then the hyperbolic functions, and there's six hyperbolic functions. Then there's the inverses. So then there's gonna be six inverse trig functions the inverse of exponential functions are logarithms. And then there's gonna be six inverse hyperbolic functions. And then we want the derivatives of all of those. And then we want the antiderivative or indefinite integral of all of those. So I will post these notes in this video right away so you can look at it this weekend. And no, the first assignment is due the 24th, I think, which is the Saturday, so next week. So that's why he's done that because depending on the order that I do it, I basically, this is what you want. There's a new kind of category of functions, transcendental functions, all the algebraic functions I can take the derivative of because I have the chain rule, quotient rule, product rule, scalar rule. I can just take the derivative of all polynomials and all rational functions and all algebraic functions. I can just take the derivative if I know what all the rules are and I do it right. But now we have these new, this new alphabet of functions, trigonometric functions and inverse trig, exponential functions and logarithms, hyperbolic functions and inverse hyperbolic functions. We need to get all these categories of functions at you, then start tell, asking you what's the derivative of all of them. And then we have to ask what are the antiderivative of all of them. They want us, I'm doing it in a slightly different order, but I'll do it in the same order as the course outline, fairly close because then it will match whatever they do in the labs. Hopefully when they do the labs, they'll talk about exponential functions. So I have to match this. But otherwise, the idea is get these new functions out there for you. Then we have to start giving you the derivative of all those new functions, which you should already know how to take derivatives. But this is the clever idea. We find the basic building blocks of each category of functions. For exponential, it's E and natural log. Then I use clever tricks to find the derivative of these. You'll see for the inverse trig ones, we use 
clever right triangles and implicit differentiation to find the derivatives of arctan and et cetera. So we'll do this next week. Have a good weekend.